Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, my name is Saurabh Sharma and we are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies course. Today is the seventh lecture titled Century of Humiliation Discourse on Imperialism. To understand this uh, topic, we need to go to the year 1793. In uh, 1793, let's look at the international situation. The British had become the predominant colonial power in the world. It had defeated the Dutch in the Fourth Anglo-Dutch War and the French before that, uh, both in North America as well as India. As a result, the British Empire had no other challengers at this point of time. So it was looking at a new frontier. China had not been explored. The relations with China had not been explored by the colonial powers except for some uh, minimal type of a um, uh, relation of Dutch and the Portuguese in, in, in China. So the British decided to send an envoy to the Chinese emperor. At that time, China was ruled by Emperor Qianglong, Qianglong Emperor. You can see his picture here, Qianglong Emperor. He was the sixth emperor of the Qing dynasty and who had been ruling China for a very long time. So he was reigning from 1735 onwards. So in 1793, he was still the emperor of China. Now Qianglong's empire was the mightiest or the largest empire in the world, perhaps second to the, uh, the Tsarist empire of, of Russia in terms of territory. But in terms of population, it was the largest. And at that time, China does not did not include just uh, uh, the, the Han Chinese territories. It also included Tibet, it included uh, Xinjiang province, it included Mongolia, it also included Taiwan. So it was a mighty empire. As, as far as the economy was concerned, China was the largest economy in the world. In terms of GDP, it was the largest economy in the world, followed by India, which was being gradually colonized by the British at that time. According to the research done by Paul Bayro and Angus Madison, okay, let me write their names. Paul Bayro and Angus Madison. In terms of GDP, China had almost 30 percent or even more of the world GDP at that time. So, the, the Angus Madison's data is uh, for the year 1820. Okay, so in 1799, it would be something close to that. So the British saw an opportunity there. The China had not been explored. Portu Portuguese and the Dutch had not gone uh, deep into the Chinese territory. They had some trade relations with China. They had occupied uh, Taiwan, which was called Formosa for a brief period of time. But eventually the Qing dynasty had conquered Formosa from uh, Portuguese and the Dutch, and it was now part of China. Only in, in Canton, that is Kwantung province, that was known as Canton at that time, this is the anglicized uh, word, uh, this anglicized word for Kwantung, okay, it was known as Canton. So in Canton, there was a, something known as the Canton system, and certain ch Chinese merchants were allowed to trade with the Europeans. So the Europeans were just confined to that particular uh, province where they did some trade, exchange goods, so on and so forth. Now pro the problem for the British was there was a, a lot of things that the uh, British or the other Europeans imported from China, porcelain, silk, tea, uh, but there was nothing that China wanted from the European powers. As a result, there was a, a disbalance in the trade. And as a result, large amount of silver was flowing into China. Okay. So to correct all these uh, practices and to uh, restore the balance and to also get entry into China and, and, and the uh, rich resources of China, the British decided to send a mission to China. And 
जॉर्ज मैकार्टनी राइट द नेम मैकार्टनी मिशन सो इज नेम इज जॉर्ज मैकार्टनी मैकार्टनी ओके वॉज सेंट टू टू पेचिंग द कैपिटल ऑफ चाइना विथ लॉट ऑफ रिलेक्टेंस ही वॉज अलाउड टू मीट द चांग लॉन्ग एम्पेर ही कैरीड विथ हिम द पर्सनल लेटर ऑफ किंग जॉर्ज द थर्ड ऑफ द यूनाइटेड किंगडम ऑफ ग्रेट ब्रिटेन एंड आयरलैंड एंड ही हैज सर्टेन रिक्वेस्ट टू मेक टू गेट फ्रॉम द चाइनीज first uh, let me uh, mention some important ones first was to establish a permanent embassy of britain in peking the capital number 2 freedom of trade to be allowed okay so china should be open for trade number 3 they wanted an island uh, of the coast of of china uh, chusan okay that, that again this is an anglicized spelling chusan okay and fourthly there was uh, a request to allow the christianity to be practiced in china because christianity had been prohibited in china okay these are some of the requests that uh, mccartney had for the chinese emperor now even before the audience with the emperor there were some diplomatic problems one of the problem was chinese ne- never had this concept of equal diplomatic relations with anyone Chinese believed in the tributary system and the mandate of heaven. So according to the mandate of heaven concept at the top there is heaven at the bottom there is earth in the middle is the son of heaven that is the Chinese emperor. So all under heaven is actually the jurisdiction of the Chinese emperor. There could be no equal to the Chinese emperor according to this construct. So whatever foreign relations China had was based on inequality. the the foreign envoys had to when when they met the chinese emperor they had to cow tow before the emperor cow tow hit your head on the floor cow tow as you can see here people cow tow before the chinese emperor okay so you had to cow tow but mccartney being a representative of the greatest power in the world britain was the predominant colonial power in the world the greatest empire at that time and it would grow even greater later on but even at that time it was a great power refused to cow tow before the chinese emperor he he wanted an a relation of equality with the chinese emperor and so it took a many days of negotiation to uh, decide on how would mccartney meet the emperor and eventually a compromise was reached as you can see from this picture this is a caricature of course so this is uh, mccartney and this is the Chiang Long Emperor. If you see his real portrait, is nothing like this it's shown in the picture. This is this is basically a French uh, cartoon. Anyhow, he is shown here to be a fat man, but he was not like that. So he decided to genuflect. McCartney instead of cow tow, he agreed to genuflect. Now genuflection is this posture, as you can see here. You put one knee on the floor, one knee is bent, and then you bow your head slightly. Okay, you don't hit your head on the floor that is known as genuflection this was the practice in european courts so in front of the european kings the subjects used to genuflect or say uh, in front of the church they used to genuflect so this was a european custom okay so finally this genuflection was done and mccartney handed over the letter of george the 3rd to chiang long emperor which was translated by some christian missionaries there i mean the christian missionaries were there in china but they were not allowed to propagate their religion among the chinese people okay they used to for their own purpose they used to be there to serve whoever like in canton there were a large number of european portuguese and and others these missionaries served them they were never allowed to legally propagate in china anyway so while translating uh, the letter into chinese they basically changed the language a bit in order to reflect the chinese custom so for example all the reference to bible and god and all those were changed by them to reflect the chinese notion of heaven and 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 to show that emperor is greater so on and so forth okay so uh, perhaps uh, chiang long did not understand what the international situation was he only knew that china was great and he was the son of heaven he was he was a mighty emperor with a mighty army and so he was not afraid of the uh, the british at that time so 
when he uh, read the letter, he wrote a reply to that letter. So, I want to show you some of the excerpts from the letter that Xiang Long wrote to George III and this was translated into English and you see the tone and the content of this letter and, and from here you will understand what is his response to the request made by the British. Okay, let us see. So, he says, you O king, you O king live beyond the confines of many seas. Nevertheless, impelled by your humble desire to partake of the benefits of our civilization, you have dispatched a mission respectfully bearing your memorial. Okay, this is a reflection of the tone of the letter by George I as it was translated to Chiang Long. Okay. Then he says, as to your entreaty to send one of your nationals to be accredited to my celestial court, uh, basically the desire to establish an embassy and to be in control of your country's trade with China, this request is contrary to all usage of my dynasty and cannot possibly entertained. Okay. So, he completely rejected that proposal of allowing British subjects to, to be stationed in uh, Beijing and, uh, and attend the court of the, the celestial emperor Wang Ti. Then it continues. So, I, I have, these are just portions from that uh, letter. If you assert that your reverence for our celestial dynasty fills you with a desire to acquire our civilization. Okay, so, so he, he, he thinks that George the third wants to learn from the Chinese civilization, our ceremonies and codes of laws. Uh, so, so, he basically thinks that the British have come in order to partake from the glories of the Chinese civilization, just like other tributary states used to do. Okay, but he says that our ceremonies and code of laws are so different that even if your envoy were able to acquire rudiments of our civilization, you could not possibly transplant our manners and customs to your alien soil. Okay, this means that the Chinese did not believe in proselytization, especially in, uh, in the far away countries. They wanted the neighboring countries to accept a tributary status, but geopolitically they did not feel it necessary extend their influence beyond their neighborhood. This is also reflected by the incident with Chang He. Chang He was the Chinese admiral who in the 1400s, early 1400s, he had a huge fleet and he took his fleet uh, to different parts of Asia and Africa and shocked and awed, awed the people there. But ultimately, his ships were destroyed and uh, uh, navigation to faraway places was prohibited in China. Okay, so, so, this is the inward looking nature of the Chinese Confucian civilization at that time. Okay, so, so, he was, uh, so, Qianglong emperor was not interested in the offer of George III to partake of Chinese civilization as he understood it. Because obviously, the George III did not want, to, uh, want, want anything from the Chinese civilization. He just wanted the Chinese wealth. But the letter was uh, translated in such a way that uh, Chiang Long uh, felt that uh, that was the desire of the king. He says, I set no value on objects strange or ingenious and have no use for your country's manufactures. Okay, so, in terms of correcting the imbalance of trade, he was not interested. He said, China does not want anything from the British. So, British was at this time just beginning with their industrial revolution. Uh, they had developed improved productive techniques and machines and so on. This is the first industrial revolution. But uh, Chiang Long was not interested in his products. Okay. So, he, he was ready to sell his products to, to, to the foreigners, but China itself had everything. It did not want anything from, from anyone. And then he ends his letter by saying, it behooves you, O king, it behooves you, O king, to respect my sentiments and to display even greater devotion and loyalty in future. Okay, so, he is expecting that eventually when he will, George III will show more loyalty in future, he might give something more to him. So, that by perpetual submission to, your, to our throne, you may secure peace and prosperity for your country hereafter. So, he, he is here um, speaking like the son of heaven, that if George III is loyal to the son of heaven, then the heaven will bless uh, George the third's country, Britain. I have already taken note of your respectful spirit of submission, have treated your mission with extreme favor and loaded it with gifts besides issuing a mandate to you, O king, honoring you 
with the bestowal of valuable presents. So, exchange of gifts just like it is done with the tributaries. Okay. So, this is done. Okay. Regarding Christianity, okay, he says, regarding your nation's worship of the Lord of heaven, it is the same religion as other European countries. So, basically, Xianglong is not interested. He says, we have our own uh, traditional system, our own moral system inculcated in, in a court, which from time immemorial has been religiously observed by the subjects. Okay, and he is not hankering after any new doctrines. Okay, so Chinese people are happy with their own ancient religion. They are not interested in Christianity. So, you see in this letter, he concedes nothing. He gives nothing except for the exchange of gifts. And uh, so, basically, it's, it shows that the mission was a complete failure. Okay, so it may, now the, see this, it may, O king, that the above proposals have been went only made by your ambassador. Now, he is offended that such kind of proposal was even made to him. Okay, he says, it was maybe you did not know it. It is your ambassador who might have on his own responsibility made these proposals. Okay, you yourself are ignorant of our dynastic regulations and had no intention of transgressing them when you express these wild ideas and hopes. And then he warns him, should your vessels touch the shore, your mer merchants will assuredly never be permitted to land or to reside there, but will be subject to instant expulsion. In that event, your barbarian merchants will have had a long journey for nothing. Do not say you were not warned in due time. Tremblingly obey and show no negligence. So, he's treating George the Third. If you look at the international politics and the international power balance of the world at that time. Perhaps he was the most powerful monarch in the world at that time. And this is what he writes to him. Okay, so, this is the first attempt by the British to, to contact the Chinese, form relations with the Chinese and Chinese basically rebuff that attempt. And at this time, China is a mighty power and so, the British could not do anything. Now, what is happening? What was happening? So, what, what, what did the British do? So, since they were not, this uh, McCartney mission did not succeed. So, the British found a new thing, okay, because they were export, importing a lot of stuff from China and there was nothing to export. And so, they found a product. That product was opium, okay. So, this is the import of opium into China, year wise, you can see. So, by 1822, it is, this is in terms of metric tons. Okay, so, because silver was flowing into China to balance the trade, they were selling opium to the Chinese and this export kept on increasing. You can see, this is how. So, that means basically the British were doing narcotic trade. They were smuggling drugs into China in order to correct the balance of trade. And so, by the year 1839, the Chinese emperor at that time Tao Kuang. Tao Kuang, 1839 was the Chinese emperor. He was the grandson of Qianglong emperor. So, Tao Kuang, he appointed a viceroy to Canton, Lin Chi Su. Lin Chi Su was appointed as a viceroy with the mandate to stop this opium trade because opium was destroying China. Large section of Chinese population had become opium addict. Okay. And as a result, the demand was rising because they were addicted. And now the balance of trade was shifting because now the demand of opium was so large that in return for the opium, the, the British were earning a lot of profit and they could use that profit to buy desired goods from China like, like tea, porcelain and silk and so on and so forth. Now, this interestingly, this opium was grown in Bengal in India where the British East India Company was ruling. So, they grew opium here and then sold it to China. As a result, uh, the balance of trade was transformed, it was changed in, in favor of the British. So, Lin Chi Su was considered to be a very moral and upright administrator. So, when he went to Kwantong, he immediately got into the task of eliminating all this drug trade. Okay. And in the final act, he basically appropriated 1.2 million kilograms of opium from the British traders and destroyed them. It took many days to destroy. It was very difficult. 
a huge quantity of opium. Now that basically hurt the pride of the British, the British mighty empire. By 1839, uh, British was even, even a greater power. They had defeated Napoleon and, and they were playing a very important role in Europe. But their empire in India was expanding. Almost now the entire India was under them. Okay, and, and their territories were expanding everywhere in Africa and so on and so forth. So Britain was a mighty empire. And so the British Parliament, a lot of noise was made that this is this is interference in free trade and this is a challenge to the might of the British Empire. You know, Queen Victoria was the was the queen at that time and so on. And so all these things were happening. And so the British decided to intervene. Okay, and then then this is the beginning of the first opium war. So, 1839, the British decide to intervene. So, the Royal British Navy, which was the mightiest navy in the world, with its most sophisticated gunboats, they attacked the coastal areas of China. In this map, you can see these are different campaigns that happen here. You can see these campaigns all over the Chinese coast. Okay, and this is the this is the movement of the British Navy. So whatever fleet that the Chinese had was easily destroyed. They were very outdated and small compared with the British. And the, and the British guns were superior. As a result, the British destroyed the Chinese, whatever Chinese Navy there was. And they were able to move, captured many of these, uh, you know, coastal uh, cities and fortresses and enter into the inner waters, that is the rivers and the you know, uh, canals in, inside China. So the British gunboats entered these. So the Chinese did not know how to respond. Even the Chinese army was not able, although Chinese army was larger, uh, because the British had better weapons and they were better trained and they had the experience of fighting with larger armies like in India. So the British army, including some Indian soldiers from the East India Company, easily defeated the Chinese army. And so the Chinese emperor had no other option. So the grandson of the Qianlong Emperor, Tao Kuang, had to now surrender to the British. He pleaded for peace and, uh, you know, the Treaty of Nanjing was signed in 1842. Okay, let, let, let's see uh, what is this Treaty of Nanjing. So let's compare this with the letter that Qianlong Emperor wrote to George III and see, let's look at the language of the Treaty of Nanjing. What does it say? It says, Victoria, by the grace of God. Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, defender of the faith, etc., etc., etc. Okay, a treaty between us and our good brother, the Emperor of China. Okay, he is, she is referring to the Emperor of China as a good brother. So it's, it's good, isn't it? In terms of international relations, this is how uh, the language is used. But for the Chinese, it's an insult because the Emperor of China is. The son of heaven, he is not a brother to any English queen. Okay, but she refers to him as our good brother. Okay, and so, uh, in fact, the tone is such that it, he is a younger brother, junior to Queen Victoria. Okay, so and so, yeah, in the year 1842, it was signed and um, okay, by representatives of ours and our good brother and so on and so forth. So this is the beginning of the century of humiliation for the Chinese. Okay, and this type of treaty is known as, as an unequal treaty. Okay, this is a very important word, unequal treaty and the beginning of century of humiliation. So here in this lecture, I have introduced you to the beginning of century of humiliation. Many things happened after that. I won't be, there's no time to go into details of each and every incident, but I'll give you a brief overview of what happened in this century? Okay, beginning with the Treaty of Nanjing. Okay, so so let's let's see. So for first opium war, the Chinese were defeated, and the Treaty of Nanjing was signed. Now, what happened in this particular treaty? Another important word here: treaty ports. So the Canton system of trade was abolished. That foreigners had to restrict themselves to Canton. That system was abolished. And five ports were opened up for the British. Canton, Amoy, Fuzhou, Ningpo and Shanghai. Some of the names I have retained the colonial names. Others I have used the Chinese name. Um, uh, because the, 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 you know, the names are similar. And so I am not, 
I will retain the uh, Chinese name instead of the colonial names. I, okay, so it, it's okay. It's my choice here. So these treaty ports were opened up for the for the foreigners. Okay. Cessation, uh, cession of Hang, Hong Kong in per, perpetuity. So Hong Kong was handed over to the British uh, permanently. Okay, it was ceded to the British permanently by the Chinese because you remember. Uh, uh, George the Third had also asked for an island where the British could uh, could uh, port their ships, where they could repair and uh, people could rest and so on. So they you uh, took it with force to so Hong Kong. They took Hong Kong for that purpose, and a large war indemnity was imposed. So huge amount of money. I think in terms of dollars, it was uh, twenty-one million dollars. Chinese had to pay to the British as the cost of the war. And they had to offer, the emperor had to offer clemency to all the Chinese collaborators. All the Chinese who sided with the British had to be forgiven. Okay. And once all these conditions were fulfilled, the British agreed to withdraw from, uh, uh, withdraw their troops from China. Now, a continuation of this treaty was another treaty, Treaty of Bog, which, which granted extraterritoriality and most favored nation status to the British. What is extraterritoriality? So in these treaty ports where British subjects would, would be living, they would not be governed by Chinese laws. No Chinese official could arrest them and punish them. They had to be handed over to the Chinese official and judged according to Chinese laws. Uh, so, uh, sorry, they had to be handed over to the British officials and judged according to the uh, British laws. That is the concept of extraterritoriality and most favored nation means the trade terms that are offered to the British, no better term would be offered to any other nation. Okay, That is the most favored nation status. So they, at this time, the Chinese were down, they were depressed and, and so other nations also started taking advantage of the weakness of the Chinese. The British were followed by the French, although French did not defeat the Chinese. But they, they also signed a treaty here, Treaty of Wampoa, where the French were also granted extraterritoriality and most favored nation status. So the French citizens also could, uh, in those days, subjects, okay, because there's a kingdom in France. So the French subjects were also could uh, enjoy the same status as the British subjects. Plus, the French added an, an extra thing that they should be recognized as the protector of the Catholics in China. Okay, so, say, so they got a foothold for Christianity also in China. So if there is some Catholic in China, they enjoyed a protected status. Okay, Chinese government could not persecute them. They had to hand, it, hand them over to the French. And the same year, the Americans also signed a treaty, Treaty of Wangxia, where they also got the same privileges at the as the British and the French, but the British were not satisfied. Okay, the opium trade was growing, as I have showed you here, growing more and more. It reached its peak in the towards the end of the 19th century, as you can see. Opium was still banned in China. Okay, it was still banned, and uh, so in the Second Opium War, the British were also joined by the French. French thought that they could also get something out of it. So the Anglo-French forces then again attacked the, the Chinese. Again, the Chinese were helpless. They were not able, they had not learned anything from the first opium war. They were not ready in terms of facing uh, the reality. And uh, so they were quickly defeated. And in fact, uh, the British and the French kept on proceeding inward because they had so many demands, the Chinese government was not ready to accept them. Okay, so initially, a few treaties were signed. 1858, treaties of Tianjin were signed and uh, the British and the French were also joined by the Russians and the Americans who did not actually participate in the war, but in the negotiations they came in. So according to these treaties, with each of these powers, China signed a treaty. So there, there are number of treaties instead of just one treaty, treaties of Tianjin. So the, the British, French, Russians and Americans were allowed to open legations in Beijing. Now, what are legations? Legations are embassies of small size. Okay, so when, when embassies are of a smaller size, they are called 
legations. So, uh, these four countries were allowed for the first time any foreign country was allowed to open embassies inside the Chinese capital. Okay. Before that, if the emperor had to meet with some envoy, the emperor used to meet outside Beijing. Okay. Foreigners are not allowed inside that city. Same with McCartney. McCartney also met the emperor outside of, of the capital. Anyhow, more treaty ports were added to the already existing list and the same rights were offered to all the four powers. So, extra territoriality and most favored nation status was offered to all the, all the four powers involved. The foreigners were also granted the right to travel inside China. Till now, they were not allowed to go inside China. So, beyond those five ports, the foreigners were not allowed to travel inside China. So, this treat, these treaties allowed the foreigners to travel inside China also. Plus, the Yangtze River also could be navigated by foreign ships for trade purposes. More war indemnity was imposed. So, China again had to pay money to the invaders. Plus, uh, rights of the Christians were also protected. So, the Christian Christianity was, was legalized eventually, not at this time immediately, but China promised to, to legalize Christianity and all three denominations would be protected. Catholics, Protestants as well as Orthodox because Russians were Orthodox Christians. So, all three important churches would be protected in China. Okay. But the war continued because the demands were not over. The, the Russians signed a separate treaty because they had some interest in Manchuria, uh, the northern part of China bordering uh, the Russian Empire. So, the treaty of Egun. In this treaty, the Russians got some territory in Manchuria. Okay, some portion of Manchuria was annexed by the Russians because the Chinese did not want the Russians also to participate in the war. They are already fighting the British and the French. So, the Br British and French, they captured the, the capital, Beijing, and the emperor escaped with his court. Uh, in fact, uh, some Britishers wanted to burn the Forbidden City. The main capital complex of the Chinese emperor was known as the Forbidden City, which is inside Beijing. But uh, eventually, they settled on the summer palace. These are uh, alternative palaces of the, of the emperor. They were burned to the ground. Anglo-French uh, troops looted them and although the French did not burn it, or the Britishers burned these palaces down, the summer palaces. Okay, so, seeing all this horror, the Chinese eventually, the Chinese court decided to surrender the anglicized word Peking here, otherwise it is Peking. I have told you before in uh, earlier lectures also, Pei means north, Qing means capital, Peking means northern capital. The British called it Peking. Okay, that is why it is written. It is the same word. The name of the capital has not changed. Some people think that the name has changed. The name has not changed. It is simply a different way of writing in English. Okay. So, in this convention, the British got Kowloon Islands, which is uh, near Hong Kong. Okay, they already got Hong Kong. Now, they also got Kowloon Islands in lease in perpetuity. So, forever, permanently, the British